Okay. Hey, welcome Branch fam. Thanks for joining us, whether you're watching live or uh, after the fact. We're grateful that you've taken the time. So uh, we're continuing to look at the kingdom of God this week. So uh, join us as we sing, and then uh, we'll look into uh, the Bible in a little bit. God, I look to you, I won't be overwhelmed. Give me vision to see things like you do. God, I look to you, you're where my help comes from. Give me wisdom to know just what to do. God, I look to you, I won't be overwhelmed. Give me vision to see things like you do. God, I look to you, you're where my help comes from. Give me wisdom, you know just what to do. And I will love you, Lord, my I will love you, Lord, my shield. I will love you, Lord, my rock. Forever, all my days, I will love you, God. Oh 
church with a dad who is a pastor and um, I've seen a lot of things you know there's like this complete subculture that that churches create and if you grew up in it then you are generally uh, privy to all the happenings in in, in that and um, at some point uh, celebrity pastors became a thing for people because they're the ones that you saw you know writing books or TV, and then somewhere along the way, when I was, you know, probably elementary school and middle school and on, there was like, you would just see uh, or see the headlines about uh, Jimmy, Jimmy Swagger and Jim Baker, and then later on, Ted Haggard and um, Tulian Chivijan, who was uh, one of uh, Billy Graham's grandsons, and all these guys who had i uh, been preaching one thing, and yet they ended up living and doing something completely different. They found themselves um, uh, just falling from grace in a big way. And, you know, more and more it seems like you hear about that kind of thing happening, that people will say one thing and they'll do another. And one of my favorite 
authors is a guy by the name of Brendan Manning, and one of his quotes, uh, he said this, he said, the greatest single cause of atheism in the world today is Christians who acknowledge Jesus with their lips, walk out the door, and deny him by their lifestyle. That's what an unbelieving world simply finds unbelievable. And the key is that if we can say whatever we want with our words, but if our lives aren't backing it up, then it, and there's an inconsistency there, um, then what good is it? It really comes down to fruit. Like, what is the fruit of our lives? What is it that people see when they see our lives? Not so much what they hear when we say things, but what do they see? And what is the, does the fruit of our life represent the kingdom of God? Does it match? If we say we believe something, um, does our life match that? You know, last week we looked at Matthew 21, and I kind of gave a synopsis of, of the whole chapter. As we're coming to the end of the book of Matthew, Jesus has, has come into the city of Jerusalem, and he's clashing big time with the people that he's butt heads with before, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. And while he's been subtle at times of telling parables that, they may not always identify themselves in. Um, he kind of throws the, the subtlety aside at, at the end of chapter 21 and goes right for the jugular of the teachers of the law and the Pharisees because he puts them firmly in this story and um, they realize it too. Um, and so if you have a Bible, you can turn to the end of chapter 21 in the book of Matthew starting in verse 33. Now, remember, um, they, if, from last week, Jesus was still talking to the same crew here. So a lot of Pharisees, a lot of teachers of law, probably his disciples as well. And we pick it up in Matthew 21, uh, verse 33. And Jesus says, listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. And he rented the vineyard to some farmers and moved to another place. When the harvest time approached, he sent his servants to the tenants to collect his fruit. The tenants seized his servants. They beat one, killed another, and stoned a third. And he sent other servants to them more than the first time, and the tenants treated them the same way. Last of all, he sent his son to them. They'll respect my son, he said. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to each other, This is the heir. Come, let's kill him and take his inheritance. And so they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will we do to those tenants? He'll bring those wretches to a wretched end, they replied, and he'll rent the vineyard to other tenants who will give him his share of the crop at harvest time. And Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the scriptures? The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this, and it's marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce its fruit. Anyone who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces. Anyone on whom it falls will be crushed. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard Jesus' parables, they knew he was talking about them. They looked for a way to arrest him, but they were afraid of the crowd because the people held that he was a prophet. And so Jesus tells a story about this landowner and, and who sends people to him. And if we are familiar with the whole context of the Bible, if we go back to the Old Testament, that we know that God had sent the, the prophets to his people to tell them um, to, to shape up pretty much and, and that they needed to repent of their sins and turn. They, they needed to hear this word of the Lord, but they didn't listen. And God continued to send prophets. If we look at a chunk of the Old Testament, it's, it's prophetic books, books that prophesied, um, not only telling them that, hey, the kingdom of God is going to come in a certain way, but the king is going to come as well. And not just David and Solomon, but like God as king. They, they didn't want to hear what they needed to hear. Um, and, you know, let's be honest. that If we read through the Old Testament prophets even today, um, 
we might not always be so enthralled with what's written there. I mean, some of the the messages of the prophets were, were harsh. And, you know, I don't know many people who like to be told when they're doing wrong, hey, you're doing wrong. I mean, like, it's not every day that um, that, that kind of thing uh, is welcome. Um, and so that's kind of what the people in the Old Testament heard. It wasn't always the most encouraging things and comforting things. But, you know, sometimes that's exactly what we need to hear. We need to hear when we find ourselves in, in places of temptation or on the, the brink of sinful behavior or wallowing in that behavior. We need someone to confront us. We need someone to, to come at us, not in a, a judgmental way, but in a caring and concerning way. Con confrontation isn't easy from either side, but, um, but I, I know that uh, when we welcome that, when we welcome, hey, being told that, hey, I need to like right the ship, then it's going to be beneficial. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, they, they were like most of us probably are, and that they didn't want to hear that. They didn't want to hear like, oh, hey, that's us. And then Jesus puts them firmly in, in the middle of this, this parable and makes them look bad by this story that he tells. And after, in this parable, the tenants, they throw out the, king, the uh, landowner's representatives Finally, the landowner says, hey, I'm going to send my son because maybe they'll treat him differently. Maybe they won't do the same thing to him. And, and what they say in verse 38, the tenants see the son and the heir of the landowner, who is Jesus, and they say, come, let's kill him and take his inheritance. And I wonder, as we think about that verse, as we think about that response, thinking like, okay, there's Jesus, he's the heir to the throne of God. And we think, well, maybe I can get the benefits of Jesus without actually having to like embrace him or embrace a life that shows the fruit of that. Maybe I can gain everything that I, I want, but not lose everything that I think I need. And so they say, let's reject him or let's ignore him. Let's take what we want and still think that we can inherit the kingdom of God. But you see the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, even though they thought that they could gain the benefits of the kingdom without Jesus, they were wrong because the key to the kingdom of God is held by Jesus. That we need to remember that he's the one who holds the key. That we can try to circumvent that. We can try to, you know, somehow manage our way in there. But that's the only way that we can get there. In, in verse 43, Jesus tells uh, all the people who are listening to him something too. Um, you know, in the verses before this, in, in chapter 21, he had said that the sinner's and the prostitutes and the tax collectors were going to get into the kingdom before these people. But here he says in verse 43 that the kingdom will be taken away from you and given to a people who produce fruit. You know, the, 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 tax, or the uh, teachers of the law and the Pharisees, they didn't want to be told that, that these people who they thought were you know, the least of, in the society were going to not only displace them in their place in line, but they're, they're going to completely displace them altogether. That they were going to um, lose their place in the kingdom because of these people. But what did it come down to? Jesus tells them. It came down to fruit. Because if you look and you say, okay, these aren't producing fruit and these are, it's a big difference. And Jesus looked at the teachers of the law and the Pharisees and, and they didn't think that they needed him. And they didn't think that they necessarily needed to produce the fruit that he was calling for. But the sinners and the tax collectors and the prostitutes, once Jesus came to them and said, this is how you need to live, they, they embraced his message. 
because he embraced them. But what is the fruit that Jesus talks about here? When Jesus says that the people who will inherit the kingdom of God are ones who are producing fruit, what does that fruit look like? If we turn over to the book of Galatians, we can see what Paul said about that. In chapter 5 of Galatians, starting in verse 19, Paul tells the people who he's writing to, first of all, hey, let me tell you what the fruit is not. And he says the acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you as I did before that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But then Paul goes on to say in verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance or patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. And Paul tells them that if you want to inherit the kingdom of God, then the fruit of the Spirit is the result of the Spirit living in you. It's love and joy and peace and patience and kindness, goodness, faithfulness gentleness, self-control. If we're really exhibiting that God has made a difference in us, then that's what we'll see. Not only that's what we'll see, but that's what everyone around us will see. We can say whatever we want, but if, if we're not exhibiting these things, then we've got to ask ourselves, has God really made a difference in us? That's the fruit of the Spirit. That's how the Holy Spirit begins to shine through us when we're saved. And, you know, here's the thing. Two things looking at that list. First of all, it's the fruit of the Spirit. It's not like the fruits of the Spirit, right? Like, so we can't say, okay, which ones am I good at? Like, oh, yeah, I can do love pretty well. I can do joy. But, ooh, patience, yeah, let's, let's put that aside. No. I mean, Paul tells us here that all of these things are things that we need to exhibit. All of these things are things that people need to see in us. Now, and let's be honest, like some of us really stink at some of the things on this list. But, but are we moving towards that? Are we moving towards like improvement in these areas? You know, I'm not saying that we're all going to, you know, reach perfection here in this list. You think about a tree as it grows fruit, Right. In the beginning of the season, the fruit looks really, really small. And then over time, it just continues to get bigger and bigger. And even when it looks ripe, it may not be appropriate to pick it because it's not fully ripe. And so you think about the fruit of the Spirit in the same way, that it's ripening on us as we grow in Christ. It's not like all of a sudden we wake up tomorrow morning and all the fruits like in full bloom on our branches. No, it takes time. And are we willing to invest that time? We're not going to necessarily flawlessly display these fruit, but are we beginning to see as God shapes and forms us, are are people around us seeing the evidence of that work in us? Paul says in verse 25, Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. And the imagery there is is somewhat lost in in English because in Greek, this idea of keeping in step is really kind of a military idea that if you think about seeing an army together, that they stay in step and in cadence with one another and nobody's off. They, They all are in step with one another. And that's What Paul is saying here is that if we are living in the Spirit, then we need to stay in step with the Spirit. We need to look like, hey, like we're all, if you have ever seen people marching and you see like a comedy or something where people get off and are completely out of step, you see how silly it looks. 
Well, Paul's telling us that we need to be in step. We need to make sure that we're in sync with the Holy Spirit here. He gives us the rhythm that we need in order to keep in step with him. And that way, again, going back to what Brennan Manning said, that the wa a watching world around us will see that we're in step and will see the fruit that we exhibit. Again, that doesn't mean that we, we just forget um, making sure that our words match that. We, we need to make sure that our words match our actions, but um, it needs to go both ways. We need to make sure that pe people, as they see us, are seeing that there's a difference in us. And so um, what, what do we do with all this? I think there's three questions we can ask ourselves in the midst of all this. The first question is, what kind of fruit are we displaying? Like, what is it that people see around us? Is it love and joy and peace and patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control? Are those, the, is that the fruit that people see? Or is it some of the other things that Paul mentioned earlier? And while some of those may seem obvious to, to us, Sometimes things like idolatry and hatred and discord and jealousy, they're, they're not as evident in, to everyone all around us. And so what kind of fruit are we displaying? The second question is, are we, are we in step with the Holy Spirit? Are we in sync with him, making sure that you know, we're taking our rhythm and timing from him rather than from other people? And then the final question, which I think is, is a convicting thing to me, is are people more or less drawn to Jesus by how we live? Are they more drawn to Jesus by how we live, or are they less drawn to Jesus? Again, going back to that quote from Brendan Manning. If we walk out the door after saying, oh, yeah, I... I love Jesus, and then, you know, we cut people off in traffic, and we do all kinds of other things, we don't display the fruit of the Spirit, then what image does that give people of who Jesus is and what he does in us and through us? And so I hope and pray that, that we would be kingdom people, that we would be people who are known by our fruit and by our walk, that people don't look at us and they hear what we say and they say, well, give him a minute because in a minute he's going to just turn around completely and go against what he already said. But instead that people will look at us and say, he doesn't or she doesn't just say that, but she lives it as well. And I can see the fruit that what, what she says and what she lives are the same thing. Let me pray for us. God, thank you. Thanks for just this word to remind us that we need to be in step with your Holy Spirit, that we need to listen and we need to, um, we need to make sure that we are um, displaying the fruit that you say is evidence of the Spirit in us. And so, God, may that be our, our vision, may that be our pursuit, that people would see you in the fruit that we yield and that we show. And so, God, continue to be with us, I pray. Give us the strength and power we need to live in such a way that people see you in us. In Jesus' name, amen.
trumpet sound Oh may I then in Him be found Dressed in His righteousness alone For oh, blessed to stand before the throne Christ alone smell of vision if we did you'd smell the fresh paint that was put here yesterday um, but um, I just am so grateful for the people who this Saturday and last Saturday have um, taken their time to to come and help out uh, and to put some fresh paint around here at the branch we're looking forward to the day that we can get in here safely and begin to have services here um, and do other things as well we're starting to do some things smaller, um, but uh, obviously we want to make sure that people are staying as healthy and safe as possible. So uh, in the meantime, we are grateful for the help. I'm grateful for people who have partnered with us and encouraged um, by that. And if you want to find out about some of the things that we're a part of here, um, if you go on our Facebook page, there's a now serving area. We continue to serve 10 families uh, in the Ashland area, and we'll uh, be doing that for the foreseeable future. If you want to find out ways that you can help in that, either delivering food or, or um, donating food, by all means, check out that Facebook page. Um, there's other things that we'll be doing as well, partnering in our community, and when our community partners put things out on social media, we're doing our best to make sure that we're sharing that so other people know. So uh, the best way to, to know about all that is, is through Facebook. There's also a newsletter that we send out, and you can get information about some of the things that are happening. Uh, we also have been uh, putting together a prayer team who is praying specifically for things throughout the week, and would love for you to join us in that. You don't have to be local to do that either. So. Um, if, if you're only online and experiencing the branch online, uh, we would love for you to partner with us in prayer. Uh, there are other ways that you can partner with us as well. If you want to um, partner with us financially, there's different ways that you can give through Venmo, through Tidely, and then also we have a post office box where um, you can send checks to as well. Uh, we are grateful for those who have partnered with us in all these different ways, in service, in finances, in prayer as well and uh, we'll just continue to see uh, and pray that uh, that this virus uh, gets vanquished or um, at least gets on the down low so that um, most of us uh, don't have to fear it anymore but in the meantime stay safe and uh, make sure that um, you're doing what you need to do uh, as you go out um, and like I said, we'll be publicizing any anything that we have um, the in person in the next few weeks and months. Um, we'll make sure that we're abiding by uh, regulations too uh, when we do meet um, in person. So, um, so thanks for taking the time again, whether you're watching live or after the fact. I'm grateful, and I hope that um, God can use you this week to to be an example, and that. People can see the fruit of Him in you throughout the week. Remember that you don't do that alone, um, but you do that uh, with what He gives you. So as you go out into this week, remember you go with the authority of the Father, you go with the power of His Holy Spirit, and you go in the name of the Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We'll see you next time.